Hi, and welcome to another episode of Studio 411. I'm your host, Larry De Silva, and uh, today we have uh, quite a uh, uh, interesting lady joining us, uh, a more than a jack of all trades. She's kind of a master of many, many facets, uh, an artist, teacher, businesswoman, a color doctor, which we'll find out a little bit more about that, a musician, and as I affectionately called her, kind of a folk rock chick as well. Uh, she's uh, has uh, uh, many interests and uh, uh, an incredible mind in terms of uh, what the way she looks at things and looks at the world. Uh, Joan Levy Hepburn is our guest today. Uh, Joan, uh, amongst uh, the many things she's up to these days, is um, uh, traveling around uh, the state and probably beyond with a traveling exhibition of oil paintings and cello music called Streams, and uh, in large part based on uh, this book here. We'll also talk about uh, some other things that she's up to. Joan, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. There you go. All right. And uh, before we start, this was totally uh, uh, impromptu. Uh, Joan has brought me a, a gift. So uh, you'll have to forgive the fancy yes. wrapping. I know. Obviously, we can we can air this even not at Christmas time. Obviously. But so. President Obama has been doing <laughs> some of these interviews lately. Yeah. And he kind of established the protocol. Okay. So. I thought you needed what was in that bag. Oh, okay. Is this is this because of a, a past show you saw, or this was uh, oh, really oh some ambiance perhaps on the on the set? Okay. Or is this oh look at here? Okay. All right. Cold so, cuts for the crew. No, no. So we're supposed to talk between two ferns. Oh, okay. So <laughs> talk between two ferns. So, uh, uh, so where, where should I position them? One over there, one and there. one over here. Okay. It's either that or we do it from my garage. There you go. All right. Are you you're familiar with Mark Marin? No. Well, the Fern Show. Do so uh -huh. there here we, we go. go. So now we're. Look at that. We're okay. according to the presidential protocol. Oh, really? Okay. Hey. I, I, I'm behind on my news, so you'll have to, you'll have to, <laughs> the president, uh, President Obama, right? Yes. Okay. Or, or when this re-airs for the 10th time, it could be president who knows what. It could be Joe Biden by then, or, or President Trump. How's that? Is that, is that thrill you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm not an overtly political artist right so I won't answer that but you may become by the time the elections are over. <laughs> no I, I actually uh, present my politics in a very subtle way okay. I teach people so that I teach them to see and think and open their minds and hopefully they come to their own conclusions very without good, me cramming it down there all right there we have a lot to cover first of all uh, I was talking to Joan earlier about this lovely photo here. Tell us again uh, who uh, is responsible for this great shot. Yeah, I call it your nice Carol King look. <laughs> I, I really no, really, it reminds me of like one of her early albums. Well, there it was. But anyway, who was the uh, the photographer? Wix Hembold, who is a wonderful photographer, and she's also a filmmaker. There you go. And uh, she came over to my stream. That's where that photograph was taken. And um, I had some ideas of uh, some of the shots that I wanted, and she just fired away for about an hour, and she came up with so many good ones. And uh, I was in my fishing waders, and I call it fishing for imagery. No, oh, it's great. That was I the really, it, it reminded me of like an, uh, a 70s album cover. <laughs> it really did. Really, that, honestly. <laughs> that's the stream on my property yeah. where uh, I got all the inspiration for my my stream oh, show. That was going to be my next question. So you've taken care of answering that. So what the, where did the uh, inspiration for the title come from? So now we know that. So let's jump ahead to your uh, your mentor, yeah. um, uh, Willem de Kooning. Am I pronouncing yes. that correctly? Uh, fill all of us in. Again, it's kind of like art history class <laughs> for me. It's in uh, conversations that Joan and I have had before very informative. Uh, uh, again, you, you mentored with this uh, uh, late artist for, what, over two decades, correct? Yes. Yeah, so tell us about him. Well, he was a Dutch immigrant. Uh, he came to this country as a, a stowaway on a ship when he was about 20 years old and uh, had some formal training in the academy in Holland and uh, it was mostly in drawing. 
And then when he arrived in the Lower East Side, he started meeting painters like Gorky, and uh, Gorky was very influential in teaching him more about painting. And everything was very different in those days. There was a lot of camaraderie, and nobody was selling art for a lot of money, and they didn't ever expect to. So they were really doing this out of an inner necessity and a passion for painting. So uh, th that's the same place that I came from. Right. Now, de Kooning, uh, for, for uh, again, many of us that are not hip to all the terminology, what type of uh, uh, painting or what type of artist does he represent? Is he, it modernism? He's, he's called an abstract expressionist. Okay. And he comes from the New York School of Painting. Okay. These are all terms that were coined by art historians and art critics, uh, as he used to say, because he liked to use a lot of Americanisms. Uh, they're not all on the same ball team. They, they just got lumped together, but they were all doing very different things. Now, at the time that he was in his his prime, which pr was even before maybe you encountered him again. Who were some of his contemporaries that, that people may, may know out there? Well, Gorky, okay. Franz Klein, of course everybody's heard of Jackson Pollock, the one who threw paint. Yeah. Um, uh, all, all of the uh, painters on the Lower East Side in uh, 40s, 50s, 60s. I was going to say, New York must have been pretty, uh, again, post-war. Yeah. You're talking about painters, and then also I've read, you know, uh, uh, about, again, the uh, kind of writer's influence that there was from a writing standpoint. You know, so many uh, people out there, and of course now that I say that, I'm blanking on some of them. They're right on the tip of my tongue. But New York must have been uh, quite a uh, quite a place for uh, for the uh, arts and literature in those Yeah, days. I think I was born in the wrong decade. Oh, okay, really? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we're glad to have you here. Otherwise, uh, you'd be, uh, I don't know, at that point, you'd be uh, much older. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yes. Uh, Joan Levy Hepburn joining us for the hour here on Studio 411. Uh, the Color Doctor, how did uh, that uh, come about, that uh, kind of moniker that you've acquired over the years? Th that name was given to me by clients. Okay. Um, when I was in my early 20s, I was trying to figure out how to earn money and live as a painter. And by complete accident, I ended up in the printing industry and found out that I had an innate sense of color that was sort of the equivalent of having perfect pitch. So I uh, specialized in doing reproductions of paintings for museums and galleries. These are the color separations that are broken into a dot pattern and uh, represent the full spectrum of color in the printed piece. And notoriously, art books were always not accurate. And when I was a child and I was out living out in the country and I didn't have easy access to museums. I had to rely on those books to study art. And I would look at the books and think, well, I, d I don't know why everybody think that s thinks that that looks great. Mm -hmm. And then I'd go to the museum and I'd say, well, that doesn't look anything like it. So okay. uh, when I found out why, it became my pet peeve to do something about it. So I spent the next 30 years changing that. So and, this uh, would not impact, the, for instance, black and white paintings or imagery. In other words, that it strictly was if we were looking, again, we'll, we'll refer to one of these images here. You're saying in a book it would not reflect the true uh, color or depth or uh, uh, quality that is the real thing. Well, um, black and white is the skeletal structure mm -hmm. of, of anything that's in color anyway. but. Uh, the color has to be cohesive in the palette when the artist is making the painting. And what would always happen is that, especially in the old days when they had pretty archaic ways of making the separation, they would have a person paint right on the film with staging varnish and then put it in uh, sodium ferrocyanide acid 
and eat the size of the dots to change the color. Wow. And it would end up looking like um, you just cut it up and patched it on. So the whole integrity of the painting would just fly apart at the seams. All the colors would be pulled out of thin air and have nothing to do with each other. It just made no sense at all. So I said, this has to be done with hands tied behind your back. Reminds me of most of, uh, was it, 70s and 80s when Hollywood tried to start colorizing films, you know, and of course our technology wasn't what it is today. I don't know still if it's perfected, but trying oh, it's, to yeah, like insert, perfect. oh yeah, well, Jimmy, and I saw a clip <coughs> one time of, I think it was Jimmy Cagney and Yankee Doodle Dandy, and I swear he, he looked like he was wearing a pink outfit, and he's standing there saying, what a great thing, it'll sell millions, because why? Because people want color. Well, not everyone. I love color or black and white imagery. I love black and white uh, photos. So again, to me, sometimes there's there's tremendous uh, tremendous uh, depth and just uh, innocence about it, and it, it it makes you see things sometimes that color doesn't. So you know that's just my take on it. Believe it or not, in the bookstores and museums, they say make that red redder so it pops off the shelf and somebody wants to buy it. Oh. They don't really care if it looks like the original painting at all. <laughs> so. Then There's the problem. Not, not aware of that. Yeah. There you so, go. Um, color is something that I've been obsessed with since I was a baby. And it's the subtlety of the color, the uh, muted tones and the contaminated colors that are the most interesting. And they're the colors that actually set off the pure colors. So, um, I've been teaching color for years, and I continue to teach it in new ways all the time. And speaking of teaching, again, you find time in your busy schedule to impart your knowledge and your abilities to a lot of younger folks. Again, you have camps. Uh, I uh, teach all ages, actually. Oh, all ages, okay. I uh, used to <coughs> teach toddlers. Now mm -hmm. I make them start at seven. Gotcha, yeah because it's um, a little more attention span yeah. perhaps yeah yeah but seven on up to people in their 90s if they want to come all go. ages some of the images behind me here are uh, from uh, the uh, the more recent uh, in 2015 the pool of memory in conjunction with the Connecticut ballet correct yes that had toured the uh, the state for uh, uh, several weeks and uh, now is that going to are we hoping to have that or that's up to uh, no it's over it, no no I know but I'm saying is that something that perhaps another ballet company or you would encourage to stage something similar or, or no well the backdrop yeah. for this ballet is being sent to Oklahoma okay so uh, that's gone um, Connecticut Ballet did the choreography I painted the, and designed the costumes and the dancers were all international dancers who came specifically for this show. Uh, one was from the Republic of Georgia, one from Mexico City, and one from Peru. And they were all fabulous, beautiful dancers. Now, tell us a little bit about, obviously, these are on uh, mannequins, mannequins. But again, how are they made out of a certain <coughs> material that is stretchy so that... It's basically a unitard, a leotard that's okay. a full bodysuit. And it's on a mannequin that I turned upside down and it didn't have the head on it, and, but it had a metal post. So I stuck it into the ground so it could stand up so I could paint it. Gotcha. And I mean, obviously these folks are all, uh, that's the uh, again, on the thin side again, but I'm just saying is that basically it's made out of a substance, as you said, leotard material stretchy. that is stretchy yeah. so that, uh, uh, and they have to be able to move in it. Right, but uh, and uh, I'm sure when you were doing specific ones, if you knew that, for instance, the female... Uh, no, I didn't know who they oh, were going to be Oh, you didn't know, for. so it really was, okay, so the, you had to just hope, okay, it better fit or else try another one on. Cause I did do yeah. uh, an extra one, um, and I had to be careful not to put the paint on to make it too stiff. It, you know, if you put it on too thick, it takes and the stretch. And now what kind of paint is used on this? It's a fabric paint. Okay. Very good. And the, the, uh, the design of those originated from the uh, gray layer in the, these stream paintings. 
uh, which were based on the Chauvet Caves. So, but not, not uh, specifically representational like tigers and leopards. And uh, you were like telling that. me a little bit about this uh, a week ago. Tell uh, uh, the, uh, the, the viewer again, the, as far as the caves, give us a little background uh, where they're located and uh, you know, uh, where you got the inspiration from so that they, they have an idea. So archaeologists found caves in France that yes. had these wonderful, amazing paintings and drawings in them. And uh, of course, the famous Lascaux uh, caves that are closed because when people start going in there and breathing and, and touching things, it, it starts to. That, that's terrible. Destroy. I don't have a bucket list per se, but I know that in a couple of years, hopefully, I get to France. I really wanted to go, so I'm bummed now. No, they. <laughs> I, I think they uh, they actually made a replica of it. Okay. And you can go to the fake one where they had artists gotcha. come in, and it's it's really pretty convincing. You better go there and tell them, look, the color doctor <laughs> is here. You well, know, they're you mostly in black and white. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, but no, that's uh, uh, I knew they were doing something. I thought they were actually kind of not enclosing it, in other words, to disturb any of the rock, but I thought they were creating some sort of almost like a... A uh, uh, plexiglass, maybe that just wouldn't be enough. It's just the, well, the air I, and the I elements. Well, I saw that they 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 actually made a sort of theme park, okay, uh, with a complete replica of it, so that they could seal off the real one and preserve it. And then when they they did the Chauvet caves, they were very careful about not letting too many people into it. But um, the the text in this book talks about uh, what the stream series is all about and it's it's not just about painting a picture of a stream for me the stream incorporated the entire gamut of art history history of civilization the origin of painting the origin of mankind and culture then you have the actual stream the mud and the rocks, the water going through it, the movement, and then the reflection of the whole world above on top. And uh, then I um, made a cello composition to stream in the room with the paintings. And part of that composition includes uh, a biophony and a, uh, it, uh, birds singing to each other and, and a migration of birds going through the property and geese and, and then a close-up recording of the water and the sounds near the stream. Mm. And when I did it, I, I didn't know if it would work. I thought if it sounds like spa music, I'm <laughs> out of there. But it worked really well. And the cello music had about 17 tracks so I would uh, wear earphones and play my cello with my computer on GarageBand, and then I'd make a track and then play to that track on the next track and built it that way. Very good. We're going to uh, see a clip of uh, that uh, in a little bit. Uh, tell us again, here are some images, again, with the uh, the work that you had done. Now, the original work, much smaller than what you yes, had to do. Yes, it's only 15 feet. Right. <laughs> and, but this now one, this one is, is 40. 40. And now yeah. there was an earlier image that uh, did they, did you have to literally create, uh, okay, there's a better shot, and there are you. Uh, uh, repainting uh, the repainting. gold. Repainting, yes, there you go. But uh, d how did that, did you have to create another uh, uh, another full work or were they able to like no make a when I I took the 15 foot painting and I laid it out on the living room floor and cantilevered a camera from a balcony above gotcha. and then shot it in three sections and put it together in Photoshop and then enlarged it from this very high resolution and now you have fractalizing uh, programs where you can blow it up and it doesn't lose the uh, Again, resolution. all due to modern technology. Uh, 20, 30, certainly 50 years ago, you, you couldn't, couldn't have do done anything. That. You'd have no, to it would look terrible. A, uh, I went replica. to uh, watch it coming off of this huge printing press and there's actually pieces of gold leaf pasted down. The first layer uh, is charcoal and gold leaf on vellum 
and the gold leaf pieces are cut and pasted and the second layer is oil paint and you can see through it S but when it was coming off the press it looked like you could just reach over and peel those gold things right off of it. high it resolution yeah, yeah that's great and now that uh, uh, obviously done with uh, folks at the Connecticut Ballet Commission to uh, you know to do that or their no I found them oh you found yeah. them there you go not surprising their and job was the dance you're the color doctor <laughs> I was ha I was in charge of the uh, the artwork, the costumes, and uh, my friend Joe Bouchard composed the music with another friend Kevin O'Neill, who is a guitar player and a composer, and uh, it all came together in about ten days. Yes, I remember uh, when when I had spoken to Joan about uh, being on the show. Uh, it was almost like pulling a tooth, but I think she finally realized that uh, okay, you know, he's uh, he's legit, <laughs> so legit that she brought me plants. Is that something? That's you'll like have to watch Between Two Ferns, and you'll understand. Okay, what this very, is good, about very good. <laughs> Didn't Shel Sil Silverstein or somebody do a book about ferns? I don't know. I have to look that. I up don't too, know. Why don't we do this? Why don't we uh, uh, take a look at uh, um, a little video of the uh, streams composition with music, as uh, Joan described, and uh, then we will uh, come back for more conversation with Joan Levy Hepburn here on Studio 411. Here we go. Back with Joan Levy Hepburn, website joanlevyartist.com. Um, our next topic over here, I found these absolutely uh, fascinating uh, given the uh, uh, very uh, uh, tragic and uh, sad turn of events. Uh, a, uh, a series of images that you did on 9-11. Uh, Tell us about that. I was very imp impressed and just amazed by that. Thank you. Um, this is a four foot by 12 foot triptych that's actually in the permanent collection of the September 11th Memorial Museum now. And after the towers fell, I couldn't really comprehend what I was looking at in pictures. And I felt really compelled to go down there and see it in person for some crazy reason. So I went down there and spent the whole day just taking it all in, literally. <laughs> and um, ended up actually getting a serious lung problem from it. But uh, I, uh, I came back and I started working on that. And uh, it, was, uh, it was kind of interesting the way it came about because years before this happened, um, I had done a study of 
my mentor de Kooning's painting excavation. So I did a great big charcoal drawing of that painting just to study the structure of it. And it was in my studio and no one ever saw it. And when I went down to Ground Zero, I said, this looks like that painting, it looks like excavation. So uh, I got home and I tore up the drawing into a lot of little pieces and I started using it as a collage as the foundation for building this mm -hmm. triptych. About a year after I finished the triptych, I found out that de Kooning had done the painting excavation based on Bruegel's painting, The Triumph of Death. And that painting is a Renaissance painting about uh, all of the things in, in people that somehow never, never seem to go away, like greed and hatred and fear and all the negative aspects of humanity that keep causing wars. So uh, I thought it was interesting that I just did it without even knowing that, that it, it found its way into that picture. As I, as I told you the other day, you have a, a, a sense of timing, a, a lot of senses, but I swear you're, uh, it's almost like you're like part psychic, you know, I mean that is a high compliment. It's well, just you, no, you, I am. Things come to you that you don't realize, and then all of a sudden it's just like a piece that just fits, and then you're like, that's why, you know. Uh, I am amazing. psychic. A lot, yeah. I try to turn it off because a lot of the time you don't <laughs> like what's coming in. But she's psychic and she still came and did the show. Is that something? <laughs> okay. Is that I something? said I try to turn yeah. it off. <laughs> <laughs> she turned it off. She says, I shouldn't pick up that telephone. No, <laughs> no, we're glad you did. Joan Levy Hepburn joining us again, uh, talking about her uh, latest book, Streams. Uh, give a plug, if you would, to the gentleman that did the uh, the uh, the essay forward to oh, the book. Oh yeah, Richard Schiff I think is the most brilliant writer and thinker about art on the planet right now. He's just amazing. He's a wonderful writer and he is the chairman of the Art and Art History Department at University of Texas in Austin. He's also written books about de Kooning and uh, he and I became friends several years ago uh, and it started an email correspondence talking about de Kooning and art in general. And when I got the idea to do this, he was right along for the ride. I was sharing it with him. So when I finished the series, uh, he seemed like the right person to, oh, to, sure. to write about it. And, uh, Have you ever met him face to face or not? Yes, actually, we after, I don't know, more than a year of correspondence, we met in New York City at the Metropolitan Museum. And we walked around and we looked at paintings and we talked nonstop. And I was saying, this is what I want to get in those stream paintings. And he goes, have you ever seen anybody do that before? And I said, no, not what I'm after. And he goes, me neither. He goes, good luck with that. <laughs> and when I finished it, he said, you did it. So uh, this series is still going on. I'm in the process right now of making eight more of these three by four foot oil paintings on canvas and hope for it to keep touring. Tell us a little bit about this. I love this image. This is uh, out. Uh, Joan loves to uh, uh, do her craft. Uh, could be day or night. You know, <laughs> she uh, she uh, showed me one recently at at her home. Again, uh, she, uh, have sleeping bag or a tent will travel, I think, as long as it's not raining. But again, that's a lovely image, you know. You recall what uh, work you were working on at that point? It was just, just... Yes, that's a painting that's about uh, four by eight feet. It's called The Exit. And that's the central part of the finished painting. That's a small section of it. See, I'm psychic too. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, that was in a show in 2010 called Land Alive. And uh, I had a big exhibition in New London and had uh, paintings hanging 20 feet up in the air in the New London train station, which is a historic building. And uh, also in a gallery that in New London and then another gallery in Providence. It was a big show. and. Um, it's a, a 
sort of the culmination of direct observational landscape painting that I had been doing since childhood. Speaking of childhood, uh, tell us, uh, again, I assumed this, and, and then I said, you know, I better ask her, and I forgot to ask before we, we started taping. You are a Connecticut native, correct? Well, I was born in Kentucky. Oh, uh, in Kentucky. There see, you go. See, look psychic. at that. Go right to the Derby. Look, I, am I psychic or what? See, I only missed on two things, but he, otherwise I'm He actually I'm wasn't off the track thoroughbred. There you go. <laughs> no, I, I, I stayed in Kentucky long enough to get the scent of horse in me, and I, okay, I started so riding when I was about So a two. transplant to Connecticut. Yes. Or was your family uh, from Kentucky no. originally? So it just happened to... No, this my dad uh, was a neurologist, mm -hmm. and he was doing his army time as a doctor, ah, Fort okay. Knox. And uh, then he got a job at Yale, and we moved to Connecticut, and he was there for the next 55 years. That's why I thought when you years. talked about your dad having worked at, at Yale, I thought, you know, you were probably born in New Haven. Whatever. No. There's young Joan, and uh, with probably... Uh, was that your first guitar? No, that was my second guitar, second but guitar. I, I always hated that guitar. It was a, a Guild F30, and the, the sound would come out and fall on the floor. Our director is shaking his head, so he obviously must know a little bit about... You, well, yeah, you like you an F30 or you hate it? <laughs> no. No, it was terrible. Met, Mets and Mets, yeah. But jo no, Joan, will, Joan will clue him in after the... Very after the frustrating taping. guitar. And I, I finally threw in the towel, and I went back to the guitar store, and I came home with a Martin D28, and I strummed it, and everybody in the house said, what was that? That's good. No, that's great. Oh, there you go. There's another. See, I saw that again. I thought of, again, an album cover. You, you, may, have you, you know, the of, humidity. Have I you ever thought help. about doing, because uh, you, you play the guitar. You, I didn't know until last week you played the cello. What well, other, not uh, very piano? well. Piano, no? No, 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 I don't play the piano. So no, at all. no other instruments. I used to play five-string banjo. Yeah. Oh, cool. There you go. Yeah, I I started out with a uh, a a Gibson RB two fifty master tone. It weighs about five hundred pounds, so it's really hard to hold, and it's loud, and it's a race to see who can play twelve notes the fastest. And I thought this bluegrass music is so monotonous. So I traded it in for uh, a, an old-timey cabskin 1890 SS Stewart banjo, thinking I was going to learn frailing. And it just wasn't in the stars for me to be a banjo player. So I, I got rid of the banjo and a 19... Don't shoot me for this. A 1950 <laughs> Martin guitar and got my cello. Wow. And that, that was a good swap. Go. Now, I learned something recently. I saw a great movie uh, called uh, Nowhere Boy. It's the, the story of young John Lennon, uh, you know, and, uh, and it was an English, English production. A um, young man who really captured the essence of Lennon. And what I didn't know was he was taught as a young boy to play the banjo. And then I guess when he met you know, the other members of what eventually became the Beatles, and he had a, a lot of difficulty mastering the guitar because I guess there's a different technique, which I was not aware of. Oh, yeah, you such a totally saying? different yeah, animal. Yeah, so also The high string is the low string. Yeah, so he had a <laughs> lot of difficulty. You know, he met little young Paul there who was, a, you know, guitar wizard. And well, he had some good teachers, didn't Yeah, and Lennon couldn't couldn't handle that, you know, oh, you know, he couldn't, that it took so long to master, but he, you know, persevered, and uh, so I, that, there you go. That, that's my knowledge of that. Uh, gentlemen that I came to not know in the physical sense face-to-face, -face, but through uh, actually um, uh, a Peter, Paul, and Mary documentary that I saw, and then subsequent special, a gentleman known as the blues biologist, who was another mentor of yours. I called him the blues biologist. Oh, okay. Everybody else called him the mayor of McDougal Street. And Dave Van Ronk. That's I right. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, did, did you you know the uh, Peter Paul Mary special I'm talking yes. about? Yes. Shortly before. Dave was supposed to be one of them. Yeah. But oh, really? Yeah. Originally, he was going to be part of Peter Paul and Mary, but it wasn't the kind of music that he was really interested in. So he, he really wanted to be a, a jazz singer. But uh, Dave was my favorite blues singer from the time that I was seven years old. My older brother brought home a record and said, listen to this. 
and I put it on and I heard this very raw recording of him singing and playing Come Back Baby and my chest was pounding and I said, I can't just listen to it, I have to do it. And my maternal grandmother had a Gibson guitar and I was visiting her and I said, show me three chords and she did and I played until my fingertips were bleeding and I never stopped. And I, I just taught myself to play by ear until uh, I met Dave Van Ronk. When I was in my younger years, I was really interested in old English music, all the old ballads and things like that. And there was a, in the 50s and early 60s, there was an English guitar player named Davy Graham. And he influenced people like Bert Yansh and John Renburn, who made the Pentangle. Mm -hmm. And uh, I loved those old romantic ballads and uh, open tunings and, you know, very moody kind of music. Of course, I, I had memorized every Dylan song word for word by the time I was 10 also, but. How about the guys like Phil Oaks? Uh, yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. All of those Greenwich Village yeah. folk singers I was just old, completely enamored with. I remember as a kid, the old Hoot Nanny TV show, and people were like, oh, and there's some great clips, which thank God that it was a show like that, because now people are like, you know, you hear these names. Well, my, my older brother uh, and I went to a boarding school in Williamstown, Massachusetts, called Buxton. And uh, we used to play Stockbridge School in soccer. So, um, of course, Arlo Guthrie went to Stockbridge School, and there were a lot of guitar players at Buxton. So they would get into the bus to go do their soccer games, and they'd throw all their instruments there. And after the soccer game, they'd have their own hoot and nanny. There so these go. were the younger generation yeah. of all those. <clears throat> that whole late fifties, early to mid sixties, before the, you know, British invasion kind of put a crimp in it. And then of course Dylan goes electric, and his whole like scandal, even though it really wasn't that. I don't think it was that big a deal. But I don't yeah. know why artists always get punished for evolving. No, exactly. You know? Yeah. yeah. Reminds me of a radio station I used to work with in college, okay? It's here in Connecticut, and anyone who knows, you know, they're kind of like a little too artsy and full of themselves, but I won't say it was. But basically, their mantra was, if you hit it big, then we can't play you, okay? Because it was just like, in, you know... Too like, commercial. Uh, in other words, they wouldn't even play like their struggling stuff. It was almost like they committed a sin oh, by, yes. you know, hitting it big. You know, well, there's like, nothing wrong <laughs> with, with musicians getting paid for their music or artists getting paid for their painting. People have to live to keep making art, you exactly, know? Exactly, exactly. So, so anyway, no, when ahead. I was about 20, I actually met Dave Van Ronk. It, when I was seven, I said to myself, I'm going to meet him someday and he's going to teach me how to play that song. And it was kind of a life quest. Yeah, and yeah. when I was 20, he was playing in a dive in New Haven Wow. And I went down there specifically to seek him out. So I walked in, and he's sitting at the end of a bar drinking Jameson's whiskey. And I walked up to him. I came up to here. <laughs> and, and I said, uh, could you show me how to play that? And he, he looked over. He looked me up and down. And he said, OK, come on in the back room. And that's how we started yeah. our guitar lessons. All right, we're going to uh, keep the camera on Joan for a second, and uh, actually we'll flip over to me if we, uh, we can. And uh, we are going to watch a second clip that uh, Joan has been kind enough to bring uh, for us to, uh, to show, the uh, pool of memory uh, uh, kind of a promo clip. A uh, little trailer. A little trailer yeah. about what, uh, what went on and uh, uh, some great stuff. So uh, let's take a look and enjoy here on Studio 411 with our guest, Joan Levy Hepburn.
We're back here with Joan Levy Hepburn joining us here for the hour. And uh, Joan, uh, again, uh, uh, I know you went to uh, a couple of the uh, events uh, with the uh, Pool of Memory, uh, uh, the one in West Hartford uh, that was uh, well received. Tell us a little bit about what, what feelings were running through your mind while, uh, while that was going on. Well, I didn't know what to expect because I hadn't seen any of the choreography. So that was my first time seeing it during that performance. And it was beautiful because the sun was setting. <coughs> there was this beautiful golden light on the stage that just brought out the costumes and the backdrop. And when the music started and the dancing started, Joe and I were sitting there together looking at each other like we were having an out-of-body experience. It was, it was really beautiful. And there were about a thousand people there. There you go. That's so it's great. Quite exciting. And uh, again, I know they had. Uh, uh, oh, tell me the story. To uh, it played in um, uh, uh, a site in Westport, and then I guess the weather was a little inclement, and then yeah. they even had some of the folks up on stage. Yes, that must have been a logistical. The audience uh, sat on the stage yeah, that must at, have been at the Levitt Pavilion. <laughs> a logistical yeah. nightmare trying to dance around all these, uh, you know, people yeah. just sitting there like a campfire. I guess there was enough room, but I wasn't there that night. Yeah. Uh, and then I went to the uh, Middletown performance, which was quite lovely, too, in the light. There you go. Um, again, uh, future projects. What, uh, what's up your sleeve? She tells me, oh, I don't have enough to talk about it. She's, <laughs> yeah, the woman doesn't sleep. Uh, her, her other half sleeps, but no, she's constantly working. But I can relate, because as we, we talked off air, I swear the older we get, and I've said this to other guests, the older we get, I think the more, uh, the busier we get in and, and things we want to well, achieve you, or succeed. Well, you're running out of time. I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. You can't do it from uh, six feet under or But I've uh, always been earn. <laughs> running full speed ahead. That's the way I, I do yeah. it. Uh, you mentioned before brothers and sisters. Uh, uh, how many uh, siblings? Four, four of us in the family, wow. two, uh, two boys and two girls. I'm sort of the strange one. I'm the artist. <laughs> no, uh, okay, so we're in the... Doctors, uh, lawyers, Indian old, chiefs. Uh, oldest to kids. youngest, you were in the middle somewhere? Yes. But see, they always say that the, the middle child is usually the... the uh, weird one. I don't know, or problematic, or yeah, eccentric, we'll, we'll say. Would you say that? <laughs> Seems normal to me, you Seems know. Seems normal to you. So what, what, uh, what things are you working on now? You, you said you're working on a couple of other images, again, kind of an extension of... Well, painting is a constant. Yeah. That always goes on. So uh, now that the ballet is done, I can go back to the studio and do eight more of these canvases and find the next location for the stream to flow. There you go. And then in your off time, I know, uh, Again, when I mentioned before about kind of like a, a folk lover and rock chick, again, I mean that with all, all the love in the world, is again, you, you play with, with various people. Your collaborator, Joe Bouchard, who, for those who don't know, is uh, a founding member of Blue Oyster Cult, has a new band called Blue Coop, and uh, uh, you get up on stage and been on cruises, and you just love to get up and uh, and, and I pick. don't like getting on a no, stage, uh, no. Actually, I hate it. Well, I I used to you look be very comfortable when I've seen the uh, the videos and images. I don't know because that we went on the Leonard Skinner Simple Man cruise with about I don't know ten or fifteen other bands I guess, and we did four three or four shows in four days on this gigantic ship in uh, uh, the Key West in the Bahamas and then back to Miami, and it was completely it was just crazy it was completely more fun than I've ever had in my life it really was and it wasn't rocking this way <laughs> so I didn't get seasick Calm seas, yes. yeah but the boat was rocking I mean it, it, there was never uh, a time when you could not hear music they would play it on on the bow of the boat in a theater in an atrium anywhere at the top of their volume levels because they're out in the middle of the ocean yeah. who are they going to bother we spoke uh, about this off air at one time uh, that's a that's a big fad <clears throat> these music cruises again there's some wonderful ones there's one i know that uh you know coming up that i would love but there's already been a few and what's great about it, there's jazz ones there's country yeah. ones there's r&b ones that's right uh, and they're just whatever uh, i don't know uh, it's, uh, 
maybe a, can we get a George Winston uh, theme? I cruise don't know. A, how about like a folk, uh, a folk? Well, one? I'll tell you, the Skinner band, the members of that band, are the nicest people, and uh, I, I watch them rehearse, and they're meticulous. You know, they're just awesome musicians, and uh, I, I, it was just thrilling to be part of that. And uh, when I was younger, uh, I did play sort of folk and blues as a solo acoustic uh, person, but I would always get completely paralyzed with stage fright. But uh, since, <laughs> since I got together with Joe, he just um, makes it so much fun, and he makes me feel like he's got my back all the time, that it, I just go along with it. I'm probably blowing my ears to smithereens, but it's, it's a fun <laughs> Oh, you ride. don't wear the... Uh, no, I, I do wear earplugs, oh, but I know, it's really I know even loud. as a, uh, you know, a person in the audience, oh, always, always a must. Always a must, boy, I'll tell you, because sometimes you get, like, stuck near one of those huge speakers and... But, y you know, I think I saw one rock concert in my life uh, before I met Joe. It was an Emerson, Lake, and Palmer concert at the New Haven Coliseum and it was so loud and the fans were screaming above the level of the music and I thought this is completely ridiculous I can't even hear the music and the whole scene was so annoying I said that's it I'm never going to another rock concert yeah I'm not surprised you said e ELP because that you know they used to do some conceptual stuff and yeah. I kind of thought oh wow you know Jonah that's that's yeah great. I like their music the, but you couldn't more even than hear yes it or whatever you couldn't hear, but and I, I thought that's weird. this is crazy yeah. so um, so I would go to the village and I would go around to the clubs with Dave Van Ronk and listen to live music and things like that but uh, I didn't know anything about rock and roll I mean I, I I listened to it on the radio. I had a record collection, but I didn't ever go to rock concerts. And so now, and now look at it. This is a whole other other like uh, kind yeah, of a career figure. that you've got going on. Here. You it's know, amazing. Uh, speaking about uh, Dave Von Ronk, uh, you're talking about uh, in the notes. Uh, you and he kind of had an interesting. Uh, kind of um, partnership. You was it uh, traded uh, uh, guitar lessons, and he was a big aficionado of art. Uh, yeah. So uh, what art. what was he into for, uh, as a you know an, an art lover? Everything. Yeah. He was he was curious and interested in everything. He was the most well read person I ever met, and he loved science fiction. He loved art. He had. A pretty good art collection uh, in the movie uh, Inside Lewin Davis that the Coen brothers did mm -hmm. uh, they actually used some of the artifacts from his collection in the movie uh, the movie really had nothing to do with Dave as a personality the movie script was loosely based on his autobiography but even uh, Dave's wife says, I don't recognize him in the movie. You know, yeah. oh, <laughs> it has yeah. nothing you, to do you with it. You can't always go by it again. It's what, what you have up here as far as memories. And again, you're fortunate that you got to know him. I just came to kind of know a little bit about him after, in a sense, Peter, Paul, and Mary in, uh, introduced me via a TV screen. And I thought, wow, I said, this man, you know, interesting. Obviously much older at that point. And as they even pointed out, was already in ill health. I assume this was what mid to late nineties when when uh, uh, he passed. he died in two thousand two. Oh, okay, all right. But uh, just uh, you know, wonderful. And see, I thought he was more folk. I didn't realize he was uh, more blues oriented. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. actually, uh, one thing that he was really proud of he he used to uh, he invented his own tablature, and uh, he completely. Uh, wrote out all of the fingering to do the entertainer, Scott Joplin, on the guitar. It's it's like a work of acrobatics. There you go. <laughs> <coughs> There's, I tell guests this all the time. I'm a great one with, a, I'm like an idea man. I can't get my own life together, but I'm great with ideas. You should be writing a biography of, of, uh, of your friend. Very good. So then we'll have you back on and you can bring me more plants. So there you go. <laughs> Joan Levy Hepburn's joined us here for the uh, hour on Studio 411. Again, uh, uh, we thank Joan, and again, uh, uh, her website, joanlevyartist.com. 
artist teacher, the color doctor. Now I know what that's all about. I've gotten an art history lesson. We hope you have too, as in addition to some of the great stories that she's told us. Uh, we thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon on Studio 411. Thank you. Have a great week.